everyone. Um, I hope you all can hear me okay. Um, thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon for this program. Um, let, I will, sorry, I have a live stream going. Um, first, we just want to acknowledge and celebrate today representing Juneteenth um, or Freedom Day. Juneteenth commemorates June 19th, 1865, when word reached Texas that slaves had been freed two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. There is still so much work to be done, but we are proud of this historic step to ensure that Juneteenth will be commemorated across the country for generations to come. As we focus today on our LGBTQ plus community in North Carolina and where we are with past and current legislation, as well as efforts for increased protections and inclusivity, I just wanna sincerely thank you for participating and prioritizing this discussion. This event is the last one in a series um, that the LGBT Center of Raleigh, SAGE of Central North Carolina and AARP North Carolina have partnered on uh, to honor this Pride Month. Without further ado, we have a very special panel to dive into this discussion with us today. Our moderator is Ms. Kendra Johnson, Executive Director of Equality NC. Kendra has a career long record of building a better, more equitable South that is strengthened by diversity, safe schools, inclusive institutions, and welcoming communities. Thank you so much for leading this program today, Kendra. Thank you, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. And I'm uh, with some of my favorite folks who are um, very strong pro-equality advocates. Um, and so I'm delighted to just kick us off to talk about where we are uh, in our fight for LGBTQ equality, both nationally and here in North Carolina. Um, so I wanna start off introducing our esteemed panelists. Um, first, I'm gonna start with Representative David Price um, from NC4, Congressional District NC4. Um, he uses he, him pronouns. And uh, I'd also like to introduce Representative Deborah Ross, who is a longtime ally of the community representing Congressional District NC2. Um, and then I would like to introduce um, Jonathan Melton, who serves on the City Council of uh, Raleigh, um, which is neighboring uh, my city of Durham, um, and who is uh, one of our um, out electeds. Um, so I want to just dive into our conversation today. Um, a uh, warm welcome to all of you. Just talking about 2021 um, is shaping up to be a very interesting year for LGBTQ equality. Um, we're having a lot of advances on one hand and a lot of setbacks on the other. Um, you know, we've seen at this point more than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills introduced nationwide um, with the vast, vast majority targeting some of the most vulnerable in the LGBTQ plus community, which are our trans youth and gender nonconforming youth. Um, we've seen historic levels of uh, trans murders that has been uh, a trend that we've seen over the last five years. Um, and then on the other hand, we've seen uh, the Biden administration lifting the ban on um, trans military service and applying the Bostock ruling to housing and Title IX uh, in education. So can you guys just tell me um, what you think is behind the, uh, this massive uh, quantity of bills that we're seeing nationally? And then I wanna talk about some positive things after that, like the Equality Act. Um, David, Deborah, do you wanna take us off, uh, kick us off? Sure, I'll uh, I'll start, and uh, Deborah and I can do a tag team here because we're uh, on the same page on these issues, and 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 both uh, Deborah actually is a little closer to the action in that she's on the Judiciary Committee that will will deal with a lot of these issues as, as a matter of committee jurisdiction. But uh, on the other hand, I'm on the Appropriations Committee, and we often have ways through appropriations of dealing with uh, these issues as well. Uh, you gave a good overview of the uh, of the kind of uh, 
glass is half full, glass is half empty uh, situation that we, we face here. We, uh, I think with the Biden administration and the lifting of some of these past um, restrictions with the passage uh, of, of our uh, comprehensive bill in the house, um, yeah, you know, we see, uh, we see some real progress, but uh, on the other hand, the, the level of violence against LBGT people and and trans people in particular in the uh, in the pandemic period is is um, it, it's part of a pattern I think of um, of violence domestic violence other kinds of violence that have increased during this period of stress and strain but it's uh, it's really uh, really distressing and uh, we uh, haven't haven't always uh, obviously reached out effectively to uh, to, to people who, who need help and who need support in, uh, in these times. So we've got to re, re, remember to, to pay attention to that and continue to pay attention even as the pandemic uh, hopefully wanes. Uh, I'll just mention specifically the housing area. We, uh, we have had a uh, fair housing rule since early in the Obama administration that uh, did include uh, LGBTQ persons. It did not at first fully include trans persons. Uh, that was a that was an omission in in the rule. I don't think it was deliberate. It was just was a matter of consciousness, I think, that it needed to be uh, broadened. And so late in the Obama administration, we did have uh, a, a an amendment of the rule. And it, uh, it turned out there was an especially important application to trans people uh, in homeless shelters and homeless shelter situations. Um, so when I, uh, when, when the Trump administration came in and I came in at the same time as ranking member and then chair of the, uh, transportation and housing appropriations subcommittee, uh, we had, um, the honorable Ben Carson attempting to reverse that rule, uh, the secretary of HUD. And, uh, we, uh, we countered that we, we had amendments in the, uh, in the appropriations bills, uh, uh, both, uh, well, two years running, where where we uh, where we said no, that rule isn't going to be reversed. And while we didn't ever enact that, the Republicans always insisted that that be removed before the final deal was done. Uh, it had its effect, and, and we really managed to uh, hold off the worst of what they might have done in that area and other fair housing areas. And now we're in a position where uh, Joe Biden and his Secretary Marsha Fudge, where they reinstate the trans rule and and reinstate fair housing in general. So uh, um, that's just a, a report from where I said about how uh, how you just got to look at the whole of government here. It's it's important to pass these comprehensive bills, but it's also important to see what mischief that individual departments or agencies might be up to, and to counter that. And of course, the organizations on this call help us do that. They're very vigilant, and we. Uh, are uh, very happy with our partnership. Um, well, I'll just um, piggyback on um, what Congressman Price has talked about and, and add a few things. First, I cannot thank Equality North Carolina enough for the unbelievable work that you have done in this state for decades decades. I still remember being in that building on 5 West Target Street, the ACLU and Equality were there and Equality couldn't afford a, a copier. So you were in the ACLU office um, making your copies and we were partners um, for all sorts of things, including the original statutory marriage ban before they got creative and tried to put it in the Constitution. And Equality not only has always stood up for the right thing and fought for the right thing. But the most important thing, and this goes to your question, Kendra, about all these backlash bills. Equality has always been on the right side, not just of history, but of the future. And you have changed public opinion even in a Southern state in North Carolina. And I think that the reason why we're seeing these backlash bills is for the same reason that we're seeing restrictions on voting rights, is the same reason that we're seeing restrictions on civil rights. Legislatures, Republican, we'll just be honest about it, legislatures have seen that the public is ahead of them and they are using these wedge issues 
to try to divide us and also to try to win points with their base. But the American people are smarter than that. And the American people are more compassionate than that. And that is why we have the control in DC, albeit by a slim margin. And let me tell you, it, it is more bipartisan than you would think. Unfortunately, some folks won't stick, say what their values are, but we, we have had a quality oriented bills passing in the general in the in the congress and we do get republican votes for it not as many as we need um to to really really change that that party and this backlash but we are getting those votes and it is important and it is a testament to all the hard work that has been done um so we're thrilled to have the equality act we also are, um, there was a bill on the House floor this week dealing with financial services and um, having self-identified um, LGBTQ businesses be able to get some benefits of protection. I will tell you that I had dinner with the woman who is doing civil rights for the Department of Education. And she said, tomorrow's gonna be a great day. And um, then the next morning, the first thing she did was text me the rule, um, the Title IX rule protecting trans youth. And so the fact that we are making this progress, building on the positive public opinion about diversity and inclusion, that means a lot. And, you know, we, we're never going to win every heart and mind, and there are always going to be haters out there. But the posse for LGBTQ plus rights and love is bigger than ever. And um, so we're just gonna keep going forward and you've got even more people than just folks like me and Congressman Price, not that we're you know, not enough, but it's a bigger group in Congress um, and from a lot of places where even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have that support. And so we just need to grow that support and we need to be proud of that support and don't be defensive. The haters are hating, because of the progress that's been made. So we're gonna hold on to that progress and we're gonna make more progress. And so you'll have my support in the Judiciary Committee, um, but more importantly, you're going to have our public support in the community. And um, laws are one thing, but the, you know, and legislatures change. But when you have that strong support in the community, we can resist any backlash. And so I'll end with that. And I know we have, we just saw Stormy. So I know we have some great uh, local support and leadership. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna uh, welcome Stormy Forte, um, who's also serves on the city council in Raleigh. Um, and just situate you, uh, Stormy, in our conversation um that we're just we were talking about a little bit about the background of 2021 shaping up to be a year of highs and lows for lgbtq equality um, with all the bad bills but then the advances that are coming out of the biden administration and just speaking of those bad bills you know i mentioned that we had had over 250 anti-lgbtq plus bills a vast majority targeting um trans youth we had three that popped up right here in North Carolina. Um, and I was asking the question I put on the table and that's before you and Jonathan is why do you think we're seeing um, those bills? And can you comment a little bit on how we beat back those bills right here in North Carolina? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit late, technical issues, but I'm glad to be here with you now. Um, I, I think the uh, political climate throughout the country is one of the reasons we're seeing the, the number of bills. Um, it's, you know, before I, I joined the council, I used to do political consulting. And certainly one of the things you know is if you feed, uh, quote unquote, the base red meat, uh, it certainly, you know, spurns interest and turnout in elections. And so uh, I'm, I, I feel pretty confident a number of uh, folks believe if you, you put a lot of bad bills out there, 
uh, what we consider to be bad bills, but on their side, they think are positives, then that uh, sort of, you know, keeps their base energized for the next election cycle. So that's probably uh, one of the reasons we're seeing uh, as many bills as we are. Um, certainly, I think uh, all of us as elected officials, you know, uh, to, to beat those bills back, uh, we have to be as proactive as we possibly can, um, understanding some of the nuances of the you know, political climate in which we're, we're um, dealing. Um, certainly, it's, it's good that the president is taking the lead, uh, as well as our members of Congress, in terms of trying to enact some federal legislation, which uh, hopefully will give us um, some additional protections here in the state. And, you know, certainly as we uh, give things some, <clears throat> excuse me, consideration locally, Locally, that would also give us an added measure of um, protection to help us help protect folks in our community. Jonathan, do you want to weigh in as, as a directly impacted person with these bills? Talk a little bit about why you think we're seeing these bills as well and how we defeated them in North Carolina. Oh, we can't, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, well, I was starting by saying I agree with council member four. So we need to make sure that that gets out there. Um, and, you know, I think what we saw recently with the three bills in North Carolina is there was a real um, groundswell of opposition <laughs> and outcry and concern. And I think that organizing and community organizing is a really strong and effective way put pressure against folks who may be trying to pass legislation that's harmful. And even if you're not a member of the LGBTQ community, I am certain you have someone in your life you love or care about who is or who loves and cares about someone who is. And I think making those personal connections and sharing those personal stories and supporting each other um, and not allowing that type of legislation to go through I think that's really important and to find groups that are already doing the organizing work and supporting them and helping them. I think that's really important as well. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I want to talk a little bit. We already touched on it a little bit, but about the Equality Act and the need for it. Um, you know, I many times when I'll give a presentation about equality and see I talk about how we've worked for um, coming up on 42 years um, and some of the core principles that we were founded on, which is that we should have um, equal uh, protection under the law, um, protection from harassment in the street and the courts, um, that we should have access to uh, equal access to housing, employment and credit. Um, you know, at, at this point, Point, I, I'm pretty clear that I have job security for uh, the time being because we really only made an advance in that regard uh, last year with the Bostock ruling. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you talk, and this is open to all of you, about where the Equality Act is and why we need it um, so much for the LGBTQ plus community? I'm, I'm happy to start with that because I made a little speech about that actually a big speech about that when it came through the rules committee um, earlier this year before it passed on the house floor. So um, obviously we're looking for the votes on the Senate side. That's the bottom line. And um, we need 10 votes unless the filibuster rule is changed. Personally, I think there are 10 senators who support the Equality Act. Personally, I think there are more than 10 senators who support the Equality Act. The question is, um, are, do they think it will hurt them personally and politically to publicly support the Equality Act? And so I know there's a lot of work being done to get that those 10 votes on the Senate side. And then of course, if the Senate changes the rules on the filibuster, I think there's no question that the Equality Act will pass. And I've talked to um, several of the advocates in DC at, as a matter of fact, one of them is was um, Ian Palmquist, who ran Equality NC. I had lunch with him about three weeks ago, and we talked about precisely this. So there is a strategy to work on it. But the reason North Carolina is the perfect example about why we need the Equality Act. It's the same reason we need the Civil Rights Act. It's the same reason we need the federal government to pass federal protections. It's because many of our states are unwilling 
to do the job that they need to do. And so while some states have these protections, others don't like North Carolina and without the federal government taking action, um, LGBTQ folks will be second class citizens as they have been. And the reason the federal government needs to do this is because this is a fundamental right for all people in the United States of America. And if some of the states won't go along, we're just gonna have to force it on them. And that is why we need the Equality Act. Uh, Equality Act is uh, quite comprehensive, uh, but uh, I think the organizations on this call need to be vigilant about this, as do we, because um, there's just no end to the mischief in the states. And we need to make sure that uh, th there's a lot of parallels. It just strikes you immediately uh, thinking about this, a lot of parallels with the area of voter suppression. And we, ha we also have comprehensive legislation called HR1 on, on, uh, on voting rights and gerrymandering and money in politics and the whole array of electoral reforms. But what we're facing there is, um, you know, the states are coming up with some newfound Trumpian mischief that uh, we're not even sure HR1 covers it. We're gonna have to revisit HR1 to make sure we're not giving state legislatures the power to overturn elections, for example. Who, who thought of that? Who dreamed that that would be on the agenda? So I don't, I don't know that exactly the same kind of reasoning applies to, uh, to this area, but uh, I mean, I know the health care provisions, for example, in the Equality Act certainly certainly deal with uh, some of the denial of health care uh, provisions that have been proposed at the state level. Some of the provisions regarding athletics, uh, all the rest. I mean, you can help us make sure that uh, we're covered. Well, I'll say a couple of things. One is we need, need to make sure that the Equality Act is up to speed in terms of covering what needs to be covered. But secondly, we need to underscore that um, these fights at the local level are not less important by virtue of the Equality Act. You, you just got to keep fighting on both uh, on both fronts. First of all, we don't know how much of the Equality Act will will be enacted in the end, and, and secondly, uh, there's every reason to just be vigilant about what new variations, um, like it's like the virus, what new mutants might uh, emerge in terms of this. Uh, of this damaging legislation at the at the local level and what it's going to take to uh, to to, uh, to stamp it out, but you know the area is covered by the Equality Act, and as as these things go, this one's pretty comprehensive. Uh, credit, education, and employment, um, housing, jury service, public accommodations, health care. I mean, it's a it's a very well drawn uh, piece of legislation, and um, as as I say, we need to make sure it's. Uh, it's as, as airtight as we can make it as this moves along. But it's, uh, it, it only gets harder from here. You know, the, the House, House passage, uh, we passed roughly the same bill two years ago. We have now passed this one. Um, there, is, um, there is some bipartisan progress as you all can maybe let us know more than we know in, in detail. Uh, I, you know, the, this is this, the, 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 the area of LGBTQ rights is, uh, is I think generational. Uh, there's a heavy, there's a strong generational element to, to this. I mean, uh, lots of people will say that their children's attitudes, uh, you know, they don't even know what the problem is. And, and, and so it, it, it is that kind of issue, but unfortunately that does not totally transcend partisan lines. It partly does. It partly does, but it doesn't, doesn't totally. And in fact, in some ways, just like our politics in general, this area has become more partisan. Uh, and, and so, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the, the struggle is, um, is, is, is really important to, uh, to, to get as good a base of support as, as we can and continue this work at the state and local level, as, as well as to uh, press ahead on the Equality Act and, uh, and do whatever it's gonna take to get those, uh, you know, probably, well, 60 votes in the Senate. We can't do everything by reconciliation, you know, the, 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 that lets us bypass the filibuster. We, uh, we have a pretty steep hill to climb here. Thank you. Um, thank you, Representative Price. Um, can we, uh, I want to pivot to Jonathan and Stormy um, to talk a little bit about um, 
exactly. Uh, you created a perfect segue. Um, how do we create um, protections at every level of the government? You know, I think uh, uh, Congressman Price talked a little bit about how um, there is there are so many issues on um, on the local level that we need to address and in the NCGA. But how do we go about creating a patchwork? of protections to ensure that folks are protected at every level. Can you two talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm happy to start. Um, you know, I think when we think of protections, we have to think comprehensively. So there are a lot of different ways that I think we protect individuals. A really obvious one is going to be you know, through non-discrimination ordinances and policies. So the city of Raleigh has had policy for non-discrimination for quite some time. It's been updated. It includes, you know, sexual orientation, gender identity. It applies to all city staff, departments, contractors. I think we have an opportunity now to expand into public accommodations and private employment. And um, I'm working on that. And I, I think we will get it done. Um, that, that is my goal to get it done. And Kendra knows that because we speak about this issue often. Um, but, um, you know, other ways that the, the city works on these issues as well is we have an office of diversity, equity and inclusion um, that has just been elevated to a department of diversity, equity and inclusion. Probably our most recent budget um, shifted, increased the resources and funding and staffing for that area. And that office, um, you know, works with folks in the community of nonprofits. Um, I know that we work with the LGBT Center of Raleigh a lot on education and creating safe spaces like the Social Equity Book Club. Um, we regularly look at, you know, the Municipal Equality Index that is put out every year by HRC about ways we can improve our protections, how we're being scored, um, what we need to do. I, I don't think there's ever a finish line you cross, right? I think that, that it's you get to a level and then you got to get to the next level. So making progress every year, every day, every month, that's my goal. And then working with folks in the community that again, are doing the work, you know, the LGBT Center of Raleigh, um, SAGE, um, you know, you got Stonewall Sports. There are big, big groups and little groups that are out there doing it. And so I just think staying active, staying vocal um, and not letting up the pressure, I think is the really important piece. Um, as far as the Equality Act is concerned, um, we don't have statewide protections in North Carolina, so it is falling to the cities and the towns to, to do it. Um, and that's fine, but ultimately we need more because even if we get all of the protections um, that anyone could want in Raleigh, you go down the road 20, 30 minutes to another town, you may not have those same protections. So what we need to do is be leading by example and to care for our residents, but then also be advocating for the uniform statewide or national protections as well. So that, that, that we don't have communities that are safe bubbles, but then our, our friends and family in other places are not provided the same. Now I'll jump in and, uh, and add uh, one thing and it's sort of across the board, you know, one of the other, the things that helps us, and I think even helps our, our members of Congress who are on the line, is for folks who are allies to reach out to other folks, not just those of us who are supportive. Um, because you're kind of preaching to the choir when you reach out to us, because we're already, you know, trying to figure out ways that we can enact, you know, ordinances on our level or legislation on the level of uh, the congressman. But there are people uh, who may need to hear from you who are not necessarily as vocal as in terms of being supporters sorry those are my dogs <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you if you reach out to other folks who you think think may be you know um interested in hearing other uh, other members of congress other members on the city council members in our general assembly and have those conversations with folks who are not necessarily the first people that you would think of in terms of being allies or advocates that probably helps us tremendously because when you're talking to me jonathan or our congress people on the call we're already there but we just need other partners to get there with us well there's no question that uh, a broad coalition is uh, better than um, than a um, than, than an advocacy situation where where it's always the same people coming and uh, you know to the extent there are unexpected or kind of uh, uh, 
the parallel voices uh, alongside that uh, uh, that that helps. And uh, having been through the bathroom bill experience in, in this state and seeing what is going on as uh, as some of the Republican leaders say, oh, this bill, no, this bill's not coming to a vote or this bill, you know, they're expressing uh, some some misgivings about about some of the most extreme measures. You're seeing this all over the all over the country with these uh, states who who don't want to go down the North Carolina path, um, you know, the HB2 path. We, uh, but one one reason for that, I'm reinforcing your point. One reason for that, of course, is that this wasn't just um, the LGBTQ community and its most uh, active friends. It was also those who saw the damage that this did to the state in terms of business and, and other areas. Yeah, I would I would echo that and say that the more that the business community can be involved and the religious community can be involved. And there are so many supportive um, religious organizations that can make their voices heard. And, you know, people see, associate religion with not being supportive of LGBTQ plus rights, but so, so many um, religions are embracing everyone. And I think it's important that they make their voices heard and to the extent that they can um, change hearts and minds in the pulpit, that's helpful as well. And I, I would also add across party lines, this, this does mm -hmm. not have to be a partisan issue. That there are, you know, LGBTQ Republicans, um, it's not a Democrat or Republican issue. There are folks in the families or friends and it is unfortunate that this has become an issue that can sort of stoke someone's base. It should not be that way. Um, and I think that the more across the aisle support that we have, um, it, it's, it's better. Well, that's true. But now it's uh, people need to be called on this when appropriate. Really. Uh, there are way too many people who are pulling their punches or who are just choosing not to offend, not, to, you, you know, and you, you know, the history of uh, where that leads is, isn't a happy history. So, so if, a, if a Republican is a friend, they need to show it, in my opinion. And, and it's a wonderful friend to have if they, if they really mean it and if they are willing to extend themselves. Yeah, that's what I meant. It, you know, step away from this being a partisan issue and say, I support LGBT equality and protections and I'm a member of the Republican Party the more we have the more support we have across we got to break down this idea that it's a partisan issue it's a human rights issue right and 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 we need a broad coalition of support awesome um so I want to uh, just take a moment you you all address some of the questions that were in the chat but we have a couple of folks who are talking about hyper focused on North Carolina and Raleigh we know that this year uh, in North Carolina post the sunset of HB 142, um, well, sunset of one of the provisions of uh, HB 142, that, i.e. that we can now pass non-discrimination ordinances in North Carolina. We've seen nine cities and counties take that step. We went from 0% of the population to almost 10% of the population with some level of protection. So there's a question um, I want to combine them. Um, what sort of advocacy is necessary to get those non-discrimination ordinances passed? And um, when can we expect to see Raleigh um, taking steps in that direction? We finally saw Charlotte announce that on August 9th, they're going to take up uh, discussions on a non-discrimination ordinance. So want to hear from y'all what, what's helpful to move Raleigh along and when we think we might see some movement in that direction. You want me to take that one story? <laughs> um, well, I, I, again, I think that the two members of council on this Zoom are probably the ones that you don't need to be contacting because we're the ones that are working on it. Um, I support uh, passing a comprehensive non-discrimination ordinance in the city of Raleigh, I'm, I'm ready to do it. I've been working on getting it done. Um, I can tell you that progress is being made. I don't have a date on when something might happen. I also think that is a bit of a nuanced issue with, and so um, I'm careful about how much I speak about it because I, I don't want it to fall over before I can get it stood up. And so 
Um, that's about where I'm at on it. The advocacy issue, again, a broad coalition. I think Raleigh's a little unique because um, they, folks always say Jones Street's in our backyard, uh, meaning the legislature is here um, half of the year or however much. And so they watch us very closely. And I think that that gives a certain um, level of maybe stress um, on certain folks who may not be as vocal and ready as council member Fort and I. And so the more um, of a coalition we have um, contacting folks other than council member Fort to get it done or contacting your local senator um, or representative in the North Carolina House or Senate saying we need this in Raleigh, um, please understand why they must do it. That would be helpful but it is actively being worked on. I, we will get it done. I, I, I will say with confidence, we will get it done, but I cannot tell you the timing, but I am, it will not be for want of trying because we are putting in a lot of effort. Thank you. Um, I wanna talk a little bit more about, we, I, I alluded to this when we opened up, but talked about um, the rising uh, and horrific statistics uh, of trans murders in the United States. And, um, you know, this year in North Carolina alone, we've already had four, um, four murders of trans women, three of them in Charlotte alone, and one in Fayetteville, uh, three black and brown women, and one uh, white trans woman, uh, all of them considered homicides. Um, can you talk a little bit about what we need to do as a state to combat um, this, this violence that this uh, deeply marginalized community is facing? I'm happy to talk about what we should be doing as a country. Um, so, you know, this is not new. This is how um, the, the fight for equality started. Um, and it just has been swept under the rug. What I can tell you is that um, there are more and more allies out there because there are more and more communities that um, themselves are recognizing that they've been victimized. I mean, we had a, you know, after this whole thing with the coronavirus and the Kung flu and all this crap, um, we, um, you know, had a three and a half hour hearing on Asian hate crimes in the uh, Constitutional Law and Civil Rights Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. And there's now a, an Asian hate crimes law that has been passed. And when we had that hearing, it had been decades since anybody even recognized that there were Asian hate crimes. And so what this goes to show is the discrimination and the hate and the violence against the trans community has been going on you know, not just for decades, for centuries, as has, you know, the, as has discrimination and slavery, as has discrimination against um, our Asian AAPI friends, as has anti-Semitism. And so we're at an inflection point where people aren't just going and, and denying it in their little corners. People are out and saying, this has got to stop. And it's got to stop, not just to my community, but to all communities. And so there are several hate crime laws that are being considered in the Judiciary Committee. You know, as we all know, there's always First Amendment issues. There, it's easy to collect statistics, but then the question becomes, how do you deal with the penalties? And so the Judiciary Committee is grappling with that right now. Um, it's something that I very much um, support moving forward on. But the great news about it is, I think we can do it for everybody um, because everybody is on board and sees everybody else as their brothers and their sisters and their um, you know, their relatives um, who can, who need protection. You know, there is, there is uh, the need here, I think, to, uh, to do two things at once, which are, which are sometimes um, seem, seem, seem to be in conflict. Uh, one thing is to really understand the particularity of this kind of crime 
this kind of hate against uh, trans people. This is a class of victims, a kind of, it, it's, it, it's, of course, the Asian Pacific community is a much, much larger uh, community, but, um, but, but there to it, there, there'd been almost a, a kind of um, amnesia about this in our, in our country, about how, uh, how awful it had once been. And, and so guess what, it's still around. But I think with the trans community, it's not, it's, it's, it's a different history, but there needs to be, I think, a calling out of this, uh, calling out of it as a hate crime, as what it is, and a, uh, and a show of solidarity uh, across the community for these particular victims and, and this particular community. That's number one. Number two, though, is that we always need to, uh, I think, uh, uh, be universal in our, um, in our efforts against hate and, and against uh, crimes of, of this sort and to appreciate the uh, common, co common cause we have. Uh, Anti-black violence, anti-Latino uh, violence, anti-anti-anti-all the anti-Semitism. So that's the, that's the challenge is to, uh, in our advocacy and in the way we talk about these things, to, to understand the particularity of this, of this crime and this targeted group, but also to, to somehow invoke that universal sense that you hope we have uh, about violence and hate in general. Jonathan Stormy, anything to add? I echo my earlier point too. Again, we need our allies to come out and you know shine a spotlight on this particular issue. Um, and again, as other panelists have alluded to, doesn't matter what your political affiliation. It's not a, a partisan issue, but certainly giving a voice to the community, particularly in light of um, some of the the crimes that are taking place. We just need our allies to to raise their voices and um, and and ask for uh, more. Um, you know, criminal penalties and, uh, and more protection. Awesome. Um, I want to talk a little bit now about our seniors. And, um, you know, we have a large population of boomers um, that are um, many without children um, in the LGBTQ plus community or other caretakers or that have been ostracized by their family that need access to affordable um, housing. And so I, you know, I, there, the question I have is what protections do there exist or uh, uh, what protections exist for our LGBTQ plus seniors um, and how, um, what um, categories of funding may be available to facilitate safe and affirming and affordable housing for the LGBTQ plus community? Well, I think the first thing to be said is that we need more housing available for the elderly population in general. We need more of a care infrastructure. That's, you know, it was a very pleasant surprise that uh, President Biden included in the jobs bill, the infrastructure bill, included the health care infrastructure, particularly the home care infrastructure. And I, I'm dealing with this every day on the uh, Transportation and Housing Appropriations Subcommittee. We just don't have enough housing. We, we do not have enough housing in the for elderly. Let's just st stick with the elderly here for a moment. The same applies for people with disabilities, people with AIDS, people with all all, all kinds of special conditions. But the need for um, housing for the elderly and uh, you know the kind of things we used to do where local congregations would set up a 501c3 and go build 40 units of elderly housing. We were, we're, we're getting that going again, and we need to. So, so we have to have the uh, provision of these services, and then, of course, make sure that they are um, that they are totally non-discriminatory, totally, and and make sure that we have the fair housing and other fair treatment uh, rules in place, and that we enforce them. Yeah. Hyper local, yeah, I was just gonna ask specifically, we know that the city and the county around Raleigh, Wake and Raleigh have set aside resources for these. How do developers who wanna create these properties access these resources in order to build, you know, safe, affordable uh, housing for LGBTQ plus seniors? Do y'all have any tips on uh, what, what folks should be looking for in order to create these facilities? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I agree with Congressman, we need more housing. We need to make it easier to build housing and specifically a diverse types of housing to be available at different income points, especially for folks who need it the most. So um, a couple of things that we've been working on in Raleigh. Well, first of all, um, this year we formally created a policy that the city, it, anybody who works with the city, if the city of Raleigh is a pro partner on any project, whether we're leasing you land or conveying land to you below fair market value, or you receive any sort of public financing, you must accept all forms of income. There should be no income discrimination, including housing choice vouchers, disability pay. Um, and that was not a formal policy before it is now. Um, we've also are starting to loosen some of our zoning laws to make it easier to build duplexes and triplexes and quads and cottage courts. Um, things that make better use of land. We're running out of space. We can't make more land. We have to make better use of what we have. Um, you know, as is that it, we can house more people. Basically, where you could only build a single family home before being able to build a duplex, where you can have two families or two individuals living there now instead of one. Um, and then the a real big thing that we're working on now is the city of Raleigh owns a lot of land. And for a really long time, we were just holding it. And I'm not really sure why. Um, but we've made it a priority now that this empty dirt's not helping anyone. Um, and what we need to do is we need to move it into um, development for affordable housing, especially. Um, and instead of doing that in a way that it gets sold off and then it's affordable for a short period of time, just maybe the first loan or the first you know, 10 or 15 years, we're, gonna, we're looking to do long-term land leases. And so we just had a work session on this where staff went through our entire real estate portfolio and identified all of these parcels of land, some of them really big, some of them really small, that we can offer up to developers um, for a request for a proposal, give us your best idea, duplexes, cottage courts, ADUs, you know, single family home apartments at, at targeting the lowest AMI possible um, for a long-term land lease. Because if we own the land, then we can, main, we can control the affordability. So all these things that you're seeing in the news where, um, affordable housing units or attainable housing units are getting sold to developers and then, then folks are getting displaced because they're going to renovate them and then they're no longer attainable at a lower rate. If it's the private community, we can, we, there's very little we can do other than, you know, advocacy and reaching out. But if we own it, then we can control it. And so that a, a new way of thinking is what I really think we've been able to sort of put into motion and we have more work to do, but I'm very excited about the work we've done already. And I'll, I'll jump in and say that uh, one of the uh, other things we, or two other things we have. Um, first, we have um, funding available through the affordable housing bond that was passed um, last fall. And so there are different programs. Uh, that that bond will provide some funding for for developers, and so I'm sure there are, you know buckets of money that can be utilized there. Um, and then thanks to our members of Congress, we've got some additional funding coming down the pipeline uh, based on uh, COVID and some other initiatives. But a lot of that uh, money is targeted for um, housing opportunities and housing initiatives. And so as we work through uh, the two funding mechanisms, that should open up opportunities for senior housing uh, for uh, protections for, for our folks in the uh, LGBTQ plus community. Awesome. Um, so I want to ask our final question before I give you all a few, just a few minutes to offer any final reflections and we start to wind down. So I want to be mindful of um, just time because you all are in the political field and you can be a bit verbose um, just to make sure that everyone has a, a, a bit of time to offer some closing thoughts about LGBTQ equality. Um, so in the same vein of our seniors, um, I have a question both on the federal level, but also here inside of North Carolina. How do we work to ensure, um, and I'm working on this in, with North Carolina with an aging plan um, uh, that contemplates LGBTQ folks, but how do we ensure that at senior facilities, we are getting cultural competency training so that when people are, do find an affordable, um, facility that is accessible, they are not marginalized inside of a place that should be, um, you know, a happy space for final years. Um, how do we ensure that there is cultural competency training for all of the staff and the residents at these facilities? Oh, I'll, I'll just take this very briefly. And then I think that probably Congressman Price, because he deals with housing so directly, will have some more, um, tangible examples, but 
what we're seeing, and this is again, something that the Biden administration has been amazing on, is that we need that kind of competency for our seniors at those facilities. We not need that kind of competency in our daycares. We need that kind of competency in our public schools. And so the focus on caregivers and making sure that we pay people well, making sure that they get the training that they need, making sure that they they are respected. You know, a lot of the people, a lot of people are, you know, of course, can be hateful, but many people who act in a hateful way ha act in a hateful way because they themselves have been treated poorly. And if we treat our caregivers as the professionals that they are, we give them the training, we pay them. We teach them about the different populations that they're going to work with. Um, then they will be better at their job, and the services that they provide will be better. And I just use, you know, again for the preschool project enlightenment, which is a half a block from my house, that teaches um, preschool teachers how to deal with diverse communities, whether that, you know, it's a, a child who's LGBTQ or a child who's hungry or whatever. And we need to respect those caregivers, give them the tools that they need and pay them well. Yes, I, I totally agree with what uh, Deborah just said and, and with the breadth of the challenge we're, we're dealing with. Uh, it's an important question what the federal government should do in designing these programs. And I, uh, I have some ideas about that, but I also think um, this, is, this is really a challenge for all of us. It's for all levels of government and for the nonprofit sector at, as well, because you're dealing, you're dealing here about uh, cultural sensitivity, about the, uh, about the, the kind of sense of uh, what kind of community we wish to be. Things that are things that are very close to home, and so I think the federal government can set some standards and can provide some services. But I also think uh, it is uh, that is not going to do the job. I think there's going to have to be implementation and a responsibility assumed all over the place for uh, for this. But uh, you know, we uh, <clears throat> we need to do more in uh, in the way of uh, service provision generally accompanying housing in this country. <clears throat> I, uh, I had a meeting uh, not too long ago with the ARC of North Carolina talking about uh, housing for people with disabilities. And uh, there was this incredible statistic. I mean, I, I, was, I was talking about how we struggle to produce more housing, okay? And how we have long waiting lists for housing, all kinds of categories. And, uh, and then they gave me this statistic. They said, you know, we have had 200 units of housing for people with disabilities that we've not been able to fill because of the absence of supportive services. I mean, that just drives you crazy. Yeah. You know, you, 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 fight for, you fight for this housing supply and then, uh, and then at some other point we drop the ball and don't have the supportive services. So you're, you're of course not talking about supportive services in general, you're talking about a very particular kind of sensitivity. And I understand that. But I am, I am saying that here, as in so many areas, there is a, there is a more general problem that we need to address and, and address it in a way that, um, that the, um, the, the question of cultural sensitivity, the question of training, uh, well, we, ju we just have to deal with that. And, um, and, and I, uh, but, but it certainly isn't enough just to throw money at housing or anything else. Um, Jonathan Stormy, I want to give you all the opportunity to just, I'm going to ask more directly, can you, can we couple um, affordable housing programs with some mandatory training around um, diversity, equity, and inclusion for the residents? I, I would imagine that, you know, with the, uh, the office or the, you know, the Department of um, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, that may be something if, if folks are going to access money that's coming through the city that we we probably could work on an initiative to make sure that training is included as a part of um, the recipients uh, getting the money. Yeah, I was going to add, I mean, we need to break down silos because we have work going on in different sectors. We have diversity and inclusion work happening. We have housing work happening and we need to bring the gap. We need to bridge the gap. Um, and so, yeah, I do think that that is something to look forward to. 
Okay, awesome. Um, well, I want to thank you all um, for participating today. Before we wind down, um, I have a final question that I'm going to give you all an opportunity to have about one minute and respect for everyone's time to um, just to answer. So all of you are either directly impacted people in the community that are LGBTQ plus or long-term allies. Um, uh, and I'm thankful that you have made my work easier at Equality and C to have, um, you know, fair-minded folks um, that have my back as I work to advance equality in this state. My question to you, and this is one minute and I will interrupt you to ensure that everyone has time, um, is what are the lessons that you have learned um, and what are the, you know, what are the things that make you proud about the movement for LGBTQ equality? Um, and I will start out with Stormy. I figured you were gonna call me first. Thanks for moderating the panel and thanks for the invitation from AARP to be here today. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest lessons I've learned is the importance of advocacy uh, around, um, you know, the different initiatives within uh, the LG, LG, <laughs> tongue -tied, LGTPQ space. Um, I think it's important that the, the community speak out. Um, and so the broad spectrum of elected officials can hear from folks in the community and how they've been impacted, um, because I think it's harder when it's just a few folks who are elected officials who are, you know, basically shouldering the bulk of the work. Um, so I definitely think advocacy and making issues broadly known through grassroots efforts and through um, elected official networks, I think um, is very important. Jonathan? I think you said Jonathan. I agree um, with everything that Council Member Fort said. Um, you know, one thing I think of is you can't stop fighting. Um, I think most of you know, I got engaged last year, I'm getting married this year. We're only six years past marriage equality. Six years ago, I could not get married. And before that, I remember canvassing and asking my neighbors to please not put a constitutional amendment in the North Carolina constitutional saying I can't get married. And, and, and there's this idea that you get exhausted, right? Having to fight for your own rights and your own um, access to just the same basic needs and, and abilities everyone else has in, in government and law. But you have to keep fighting because marriage equality was not, is not the end. That was, that was almost step one, really. And a real big thing that I think everyone needs to remember is our community is not monolithic. And there are, you know, I'm a cisgendered white gay man and I have a lot more privilege um, than a lot of members of the LGBTQ community. And I have to use my voice twice as loud to help you know, the black transgendered member of our community have the same rights and access that I do. And we're, we're both LGBTQ people. And so I think that we have to keep fighting for greater acceptance and equality. And you cannot say, well, we won one battle and the fight's done. It's not. I think we can celebrate the fact that I'm getting married this year and we keep fighting. Congressman Ross. Um, well, I would agree with everything that's been said but I'll add something, and this was a point that Stormy made early on, and it's a point that I learned when I was in your shoes, Kendra, being the advocate, going down to the General Assembly, doing the protests, you know, doing the voting charts, and that's that we have got to be bridge builders and find our allies. Um, because, you know, I was in my 30s down at the General Assembly, you know, talking about L LGBTQ rights and people were like, they didn't even want to talk to the person who came to advocate. They couldn't even look that person in the eye. And so I would try to find the people who would be helpful to me. And sometimes they would be helpful for one day and wouldn't be helpful for another day, but you have to keep working on it, building those bridges, building the bridges with the business community, building the bridges with the religious community, building the bridges across party lines, building the bridges with the mother of, a, of her child. And, and, and every single one of those efforts and attempts pays off, even if it doesn't pay off immediately. So I would just add that. Thank you. And last, certainly, but not least, Congressman Price. Well, I would say, first of all, remember lessons one, two, and three, what you've just heard, all, all of those are important. And uh, 
I'd add, given the groups that are on this call, the organizations uh, who are all pretty sophisticated and pretty well steeped in the political process, uh, understand how much of federal policy benefiting us here at home is uh, potentially within your control. Again, I'm thinking about housing, but there are lots of areas this agrees to. You know, that, that uh, held, housing for the elderly, you know, we can appropriate money uh, very generously, but uh, there's gonna have to be a, a local group that takes this on. Same for disabled housing, same for housing with people with AIDS, same goes for, um, for, for, for many, many things that we're, we're talking about. So um, don't, this, you know, this doesn't just, it's not like manna coming down from heaven. You know, the way, the way federal funds get spent often depends on a lot of local initiative. All of you know that, I'm just underscoring it. So collaborate with us, come to talk to Deborah and me about your, um, about your, uh, the gaps you see in, in, the, in the community in terms of service provision or the way things aren't being done quite right. Um, you know, we might, um, we might have some things to suggest. You certainly can help us figure out where to put our emphasis on uh, the, the kind of money that's most likely to be well spent and, and productively spent here at, here at home. Understand this is a federal system and, and federalism doesn't just mean federal, state, local. It also means a, a lot of initiative uh, at the grassroots level to, uh, to figure out what our community needs and how to go after it and really go after it, go after it vigorously. Thank you all for taking the time out to talk about equality and thank you for everything that you do every day to support the LGBTQ plus um, community. Um, our lives would not be the same without your work and your advocacy. Um, and happy Pride Month, happy Juneteenth. Um, and thank you all for being here with us. Uh, have a great weekend. Thank you.